I Love Mortgage Brokering, Episode 10. Want to rock your mortgage business? Then crank up the volume with your host, Scott Peckford, on I Love Mortgage Brokering. Hi, Broker Nation. I am thrilled to introduce our guest today, Holly Cochran. Holly is a mortgage broker with Mortgage Architects. She is based out of Stony Plain and First Grove. She's been a mortgage broker for three years, but have been in banking for the last 19 years. Hi, Holly. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing, Scott? So, Holly, would you just take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business? Hmm. Well, uh, like you said, I've been um, brokering for the last three years. Prior to that, I worked for a major financial institution doing mortgages. Um, both, I started out in the branch and then I moved over to their mortgage specialist role. Um, my market area has always remained the same, um, primarily Spruce Grove and Stony Plain. And um, uh, the main focus for me is uh, I have in-house relationships with two Remax offices and I, I work uh, I I work very closely with the realtors. And so, tell me a little bit about your. You were in. You were a bank in banking for a while, then you became a broker. But what about your per? Like, do you have kids? What about that part of your life? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I actually started doing this um, when when my bank merged with another bank. I started uh, the mortgage specialist role um, because my children are a little bit older. So I have uh, that was like what fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago now. So I have a daughter who's twenty three and a son who's nineteen. Um, um, so yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm I, I'm kidless now. <laughs> Any of your kids interested in joining the business? No, <laughs> I think that's typical. I, yeah. I think it's typical that they see they see what their mother goes through and and uh, they don't want uh, they see it like they don't want to be consumed with work all the time, right? So right. Yeah, it's it's definitely a it's a full time job. As we were saying just before we got on the air, this is not something that you can do very well part time for very long. Yeah. No, and and so I just also for for me when I was at the bank, I took a stint um, managing, and uh, the stint I took managing was over like a four year period of time, and um, in that time was when we had our boom in Alberta. So I missed I missed the market. So my focus is a lot um, stronger now because you know I, I I see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of um, you know I want to work hard for the next five or ten years, and then I'm retiring. So it's go big or go home right now so right and, and so the transition from working at a bank bank special or being in a branch 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 special or mortgage specialist then to broker so just tell, talk about a little bit about that transition what prompted you to make the jump from mortgage specialist to broker um you know what it was it was a thought it started out as a thought right and then for me it's like i started experiencing um, situations where a, a client I, I, I could have helped the year before I couldn't help um, just because of process changes at the bank uh, along with them. Um, you know, the bank just kind of moving their their uh, center from the west out to the east, so there's just a whole bunch of changes which they have absolutely the right to do, but it just made me look at my business. So then I, then I took on a hat of, okay, what would it look like if I was a mortgage broker? And I, I tried that hat on in my head for about a year um, before the decision was finally made that, you know what, I got to give this a try because my service level was dropping off because I couldn't do the deals I used to do. And um, when you're when you're in a referral-based uh, business, you can't have that happen. If you say no to the realtors more than a few times, then you know what, they're looking for somebody else, right? So that's really what prompted me to do it and uh, transition wise uh, it was a challenge no doubt but um, I was fortunate to have um, six other people walk beside me um, there was a, a few of us that all left together and we jumped into it together and supported one another and it, it worked out well that's good so what was what my wife also started out in banking and then became a broker and it was, so what was your biggest surprise going from being at the branch to, to switching to mortgage brokering Oh, my biggest surprise. You know, I thought I knew the job. <laughs> I knew how to do a mortgage, right? 
and I, I knew how to do a mortgage well, but I, I really didn't understand the mortgage brokering side of things, you know, status, volume, bonus. What do you mean I have to prove to you who I am? You know, like that part was a bit of a, a learning a learning curve, but it didn't take long. I mean, it just is, it made sense. Um, it didn't take long to kind of jump right into it. And, you know, people are people, whether it be an underwriter at one bank versus another, it's all about relationships. So it was a bit of a shock, uh, but... It, you know, I, we adapted and I adapted very quickly to it. Yeah, that's the same thing my wife actually said. She thought she thought she was pretty good at lending and then she switched to this. And she's like, wow, there's so many more options and so much more to keep track of that it uh, it really, it, you know, she had, there was a learning curve, but she's just like you, she's smart and was able to catch on pretty quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So before we dive into your story, I always like to start with a success quote that has impacted your life or business. So can you share with us a quote that you've, that's really um, made an impact for you? You know, I thought long and hard about this one because you helped out with giving me some questions ahead of time. It's like, I don't have one. <laughs> like, you know, I I think integrity is, is huge. Um, I don't have a quote attached to it. I think, you know, uh, under promise, over deliver is something that I've always tried to live by. Um, you know, there's so many. There's so many just little things that it's like, you know, just be truthful, be honest, care, you know you know, treat every client the way you'd want to be treated. You know, all of those things are, are mixed into my business. So I like that. The first one I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to camp out on. So under promise over deliver. So I, I totally agree. I think that it's all about our business is a lot about managing expectations. So can you share an example of a time that you were able to apply that, that, that idea or that concept to your business? Um, actually, just happened last week. Um, I had a client who wanted to go to a lender just based on a relationship that he had for many years. That um, I said to him, you know, um, here's the thing. Uh, absolutely, we can go to that lender, but this is the way it's going to feel. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to cause you stress. But, you know, as long as you're prepared to kind of work through this, uh, I'll do what I can to make it all work for you. And he said, yeah, I, I'm ready for it, Holly. So, you know, I, I gave him a turnaround time of about six, seven days, and um, I don't know what happened that day because I was, I, I didn't feel like I was um, under-promising, but I, I felt like I was setting the right expectation. Uh, anyway, I was able to deliver a commitment within two days, um, and then he was shocked, right? So he was like, wow, you know, thanks so much for your help. And I just think that, you know, just communicating what some of the challenges can be in our business instead of just ignoring it and saying, you know, like the phone's ringing and it's your client who has a condition of financing two days from now. Well, you don't have an answer for them, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to them. And and I hear that time and time again. People say, you know, I was dealing with a mortgage broker or bank specialist and they're not returning my call. It's like this is one of the most stressful times for clients and they, they need to hear from you every single day to say where you're at. That's what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. You know, it's, it's funny because when, on the flip side, I, I, when an underwriter is not getting back to you, you're, you know, you're calling them, emailing them and you want an answer and you're like, why are they not? It's so, um, it's so stressful and it makes you, and the, the client feels the same way because to them, it's the same relationship. They're wait, they need to wait to hear from you. And if you don't at least explain to them where everything's at, then it, it does create a whole bunch of angst and yeah, it's it's something. And but you know, when you do, when, typically I've found anyway myself when I haven't been this quick to want to pick up that phone, it's because things are not going as well as you'd like, and you 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 want to have a, a good answer, not a I don't know answer. And so, but it's probably better to just say I don't know yet, and here's where we're at, and then to not say anything. I try like if I, I get the sense from the client, so I kind of read your client a bit too that they're the type of client that wants to be communicated with regularly. I try and jump beat them to it and just say that here's what we're at today. Right. So this is what this is where we're at. Um, this is what my plan is going to be if we don't hear by this time. You know, just communication. Can Lots you, of communication. Right. That's fantastic. So can you share? I, I also find that talking to mortgage brokers, entrepreneurs, that we all have had failures in life. And thing, I know I have. I've made some some mistakes. And can you share an example of something you failed at and the, the lesson that you learned from it? Sure. Um, when I first started out as a mortgage specialist with the bank, um, the bank was just getting into the um, 
let's develop in-house relationships with realtors. So the bank made us pay a portion of what they considered to be the desk fee. Um, so we'd have skin in the game, right? And uh, um, I was really fortunate and I got two little offices right off the bat. Um, and although I won't say it was complete failure, uh, I would say that it wasn't as successful as I'd want it to be and I learned a ton from it. It was like... I had the expectation that because I was paying a desk fee and because I was sitting in that office that those realtors would deal with me. Like, like why aren't the deals just coming onto my desk? What's, what's going on here? Um, so I kind of went through that for two, three years in terms of, you know, it, it came after a while, but it still, to me, wasn't what I expected it to be. Um, and I, I learned a great deal from that. And I didn't learn it until um, I didn't really see the issues or the problems or understand what was going on until I became a manager. And it was, you know, the right to be in an office just doesn't, you know, it comes from the broker owner saying yes. But ultimately, um, these people are independent um, business people who, uh, who need people to build a relationship with. So I had the expectation I was just going to get the business, but I didn't do the work to get the relationship that, that would actually bring the business in. So that's what I learned from it. And so when I um, went back in the second time after taking a manager's role for five years, my approach was completely different, completely different. And um, now it's, it's the, the, a large percentage of where I get my business from is from um, the realtors within my in-house. So can you give me an example of like when you say your approach was different? So what's some of the things that you did to, to build those relationships to with those initially when you got into that office? Uh, initially or the second time around? The second time, yes, right. After you had learned the lesson of you can't just sit and hope that they're going to bring you work. Yeah, uh, you know what? I started sharing. Um, uh, I didn't go after it hard in terms of deal with me, deal with me. I, I didn't do any lame um, you know, schmoozy sales approach. Um, I, I under-promised and I over-delivered. Um, I relied on um, monthly meetings to share my success stories, to educate them within the market. Um, I became part of them in terms of, you know, participating in any community event that they were at, um, you know, their golf tournaments. I just became part of the family. Um, and instead of being an outsider within, I became an insider. And uh, uh, now uh, I don't have to promote myself anymore within the office. They promote, they promote me. Right. right? So, like the broker owner, I actually had a, uh, when I went back in the second time, we sat and dissected what happened the first time. And, um, you know, I, I told him, he, you know, he couldn't just sit back and collect the check and expect the business to come either. If he wanted the check to increase, then he needed to be a partner with me to make sure that happened. And, you know, this is the way I feel I need his support. And it worked. Yeah, I know that that's fantastic. I know in the past I've been in a real estate office before and, you know, same thing. You think, OK, I'm, there's however many realtors you think this is going to be fantastic. But there is a and you, there's still it's on you to, to build those relationships. What I found I like doing was sharing stories at those meetings. So I'd always give a story of, you know, something that had happened. And I wouldn't go into, you know, the names and stuff, but just so that. They would go, oh, okay, I, if I run into that situation, I can, I didn't know. And I always wanted to leave them with, I didn't know that. Because then they, they really start to think that you're the, the, the expert, right? So you try to create, you try to tell a story of a, some, a problem you solve for someone. And then they would go, oh, man, next time I need to, someone, you know, talk to Holly or Scott or whoever they're, they're dealing with. Yeah, you know, the real estate business is fast paced, right? If you've, you've got five or six days and in those five or six days, the realtors, uh, relationship, the realtor's reputation, and the realtor's paychecks on the table for them. So there's a lot of stress for them in those five or six days in terms of making sure that um, the person that's taking care of the clients, the mortgage needs, is doing a good job, right? Mm -hmm. So I think realtors over the past 10 years have really evolved to understand it's important for them to own that relationship, not for not, I mean, I, I think that it's a, a bit of a fine line too. They can't necessarily tell the clients what to do, but they can share their 
there are stories, you know, mm-hmm. of, you know, I, I get what you're saying. Um, you want to go back to your person that you dealt with at the bank. This has been my experience in the last little while. Why don't you give my person a call? You know, so that has changed a lot. And I think that um, it's important to, you know, look at a, re- a real estate office and say, how can I support you? You know, not necessarily care to be giving the referrals, right? Right. That's great. And so another thing... Switching gears a little bit, another thing I noticed that successful mortgage brokers have is they have a process or a system. So, and they have it in different parts of their business, the administrative systems, they have sales systems and processes, and they're also willing to make some adjustments as the market seems fit or as what seems to be working. So, can you share an example of a process? It can be sales or administrative that maybe wasn't working the way you liked, and then an adjustment that you made and the outcome you got. Well, from a sales perspective, I think that I covered that off in the, the last question. But from a uh, back office admin, I think it's important to be organized. I think it's important to um, you know where you're at every single day with every single file. Um, so uh, I made a commitment to myself last year that I was going to go paperless. So I've done that. I'm completely paperless. I have a little book that I walk around with alongside a... Uh, um, a Mac computer, and that's that's it. Um, I utilize a, a cloud for my files. Um, within the cloud, I'm organized in terms of the stages of the file. So whether it be a new file, um, a file that's uh, out to the lender in terms of either pre-approved or live. Um, once they're back, if there's a file for pre-approved within. Um, once they're approved, I've conditionally approved files, both builder and you know, um, and just other files. And then I've got uh, files for when clients are up for signing. So at a, a snapshot, I can go into my uh, cloud and I can see where is each file at and what do I need to do with that file today. So mm-hmm. I'm a big list maker and also I tried actually to go paperless with lists this year um, just to make myself a to-do every day in my inbox. But I haven't really adapted to that yet, but I have a, a to-do in my book and every single day uh, the to-do is, it's actually touched about four times a day. Um, the, the last thing I do every single night is I quickly write down the things that I need to do the next morning, just off the top of my head before I shut down. And then first thing in the morning before I Bef- bef- well, while I'm having my coffee, I go through my inbox and I go through my um, uh, my cloud and I look at every file and I say, what do I need to do with that file today? And I give myself another to-do list. And then I manage that list all day long and things go off of it, come on it, go off of it, come on it. And, and it, it just keeps me organized. Like, uh, and... I, I don't know. I can't tell you how much more productive I am since I um, I created that system. It's unbelievable. It's probably improved. I had a full time assistant the year before, and I'm now down to really I'd say half time support. And I'm doing as much volume or more without somebody around because I'm organized. Right, because of this, because of the system. So when you said this, I love this. By the way, this is totally your up my alley as far as uh, the administrative process. So you said that you're going paperless. So your clients, they must, you must have paper for them though, right? You still get them to sign a paper copy or do, you, do they sign electronically? Well, it depends on the client, but um, if a client insists on meeting face-to-face or if that's what they want to do, I sit down with them and I make sure that I'm usually in front of a scanner. So what I do is I meet with them. I have them sign their set of documents and then I scan to myself. I make sure I get the email and then I send them on the way with one set of documents. So I only print, I only, I, excuse me. I only print one set of documents. I don't print more than one, ever. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. And then you have an assistant or assistant process as well, right? That's right. So I have, um, I hired a company last year. I was struggling with having um, um, assistants leave me constantly, and it was frustrating. So I, um, just by fluke, I was uh, out for lunch with a, uh, a friend of mine who has an admin based business, and she, um, she fills in for um, 
uh, doctor's offices primarily. Um, but it's a little bit more than, say, that, you know, um, uh, I don't know, temporary worker. She, she actually sits down with the doctor. She just sits down with the doctor and finds out how, what makes their business run, what kind of support they need, and she creates um, standard operating procedures for every task. Okay, so I, I said, well, you know, if you know anybody that can help me, why, you know, let me know. And she said, well, why don't you let us? And so I, I sat with her for months uh, on and off, and we developed um, a standard operating procedures for my business. So the, the, I guess the thing that works is, number one, um, anything they do for me is directed. So they're not involved in my business. I tell them what I want done, but I don't have to tell them all the time. So for example, um, they know the process when you get a new file because we have a standard operating procedure for that. So I send an email to them and I say new file, client's name, who referred it, uh, the notes to the file, um, and the documents attached. They divide it, they organize it, they add the contact to my, uh, my uh, uh, contact list within my email. They add, um, you know, if there's a purchase agreement, they add the condition of financing and the possession date on my calendar. Uh, they create a deal note sheet so anybody in my business or that supports me can go in and see where the file is at. Um, they upload the documents for consent for the credit bureau rate to work bench. So anything directed, that's what they do. When I get a conditional approval in, uh, I send a note to them saying, um, here's a commitment, pull the commitment and prepare docs. That's all I say. And then they go in and they prepare the documents for signing. So they add whatever docs are missing, whether it be gift letter, uh, the commitment, the pad. Um, you know, if, if it was a web app and I need a written consent, she gets that at that time. Um, and then in, within the folder within the cloud, there's a, there's a, 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 new, a new document called unsigned documents. I then either print that off and put it in the folder and meet with the client, or a template has been made with the assistance of them for every single lender that has a shell for how to sign a TD doc set of documents, how to sign a MCAP set of documents, and then the email just goes out to the client. I love that. That is so, you know, it was when we were talking before we got on the air to do this, you'd said, well, you know, I don't know. I just kind of do what I do and you do what you do. But again, after the 26 years you've been doing this and, and learning how to make your processes efficient so you're able to be more profitable and less stressed. This is like, this is money. I love the, the, how the efficiency of this. And I agree as a mortgage broker today, we need to be thinking more about how do we how do we you know, take advantage of technology and be able to still deliver a high amount of service to our clients? So good on you for finding a solution that uh, it, this, this is this awesome. So I'm, mm -hmm. I know, I, I, when we talked about it briefly before, I was hoping you were going to talk about it. So I sort of led you there. I was like, I hope she mentions this. <laughs> and I kind of led it and I'm like, yes, uh, she did. She talked. About I'm really this. proud of it, too. So it's like, you know, it's, it was a long time coming. I wasn't the most organized person. And now it's like I can just get a drop of a hat and know where everything's at. And it's such, it's so like I don't have a lot of stress when it comes to do with the paper anymore. It's just there. Right. You know? Now it's just the, getting the lenders to give you, to uh, issue the approval mm -hmm. is the tricky bit. So, okay. Well, let's, well, yeah. I and mean, you know what? And that's my job, right? right? That's like, exactly. That's what you get paid for in order to, to that's where. Yeah. Yeah. I used to have assistants that I wanted. I, I, when I first started this, I thought, oh, I'm going to, eventually I'm going to be the person that goes and gets a business and, and uh, then I'll have an, an underwriter kind of underwrite the file for me in terms of getting it out to the lender. And I tried that. It didn't work. Um, the reason it didn't work for me is, A, I'm probably too much of a control freak. And um, I'm just not at the level of my business where I'm ready to let it go. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the people that deserve my attention the most are my client, my realtor, and my underwriter. Right. right. So I'm involved in that process. I have support at the beginning and I have support at the end. My job is the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me the money. <laughs> and that's what makes me successful within my clients, with my clients and my realtors. Right. So if you're going to have a bad experience, you know, hopefully it's not there. If we miss something on the front or we miss something on the back in terms of, oh, I forgot to get you to sign this form, the clients are going to be upset about that. But in the middle, if there's a miscommunication, and that's what I was finding a struggle with uh, with assistance, is there's 
too much up in my head in order to tell somebody. Like, you know, this is where the file's at, this is what I want you to do. They don't always hear what you say. So if I own the part that matters, the rest of it, it, it it's, if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. But if you make a mistake on, oh, you know, I wanted to put 15% down instead of, you know, or I wanted to put 5% down and you got me approved at 10, or I didn't want to pay that debt out, that's a, that's a critical piece. So that's mine. I love that. Own the part that matters. That that, that mm-hmm. actually, the question I was going to ask you is what habits made you successful, but you just answered it before I asked you the question. So good job. Uh, that, that I'm going to switch gears again a little bit to talk about um, recurring revenue or diversifying your income. So I've heard a lot of talk in our industry about this, the need or the importance of diversifying income. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on the, uh, are, is it something that you're looking at doing or is it something that you're not looking at doing? No, I, I actually, and I think, you know, it's, I have a pretty strong opinion about it, but, um, and it comes from not being open, it comes from doing that, okay? Uh, when I worked in the bank, I was a financial advisor, that's what I was called, and uh, I started out lending, but I also did accounts, and then all of a sudden it was like, well, we want you to get your um, financial planning certification, and, you know, We'd also like you to delve a little bit into small business banking, right? And it's like, my hat was so full, uh, I just really couldn't become an expert at anything. And I, I came to a fork in a road and I said, okay, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do this. And I, I don't feel that I'm, I'm really good at anything because I'm way too involved. So I, I made the shift to mortgage specialist. And... Um, that's where I found out. That's the best. That's what I was the best at. Right? Didn't mean I. I think it's good to have an understanding of all of those other products in terms of, say, life insurance. In terms of, you know, to have a proper con- conversation with a client about a mortgage. I think you do need to know what their goals are going forward. So you know, a little bit of financial planning has to be kind of put in there. So I think to have the knowledge is great. But I rely on referrals from realtors to grow my business and maintain my business and from others, right? So I look at it like I want to have those professionals surrounded around me in terms of I have a financial planner that I refer to. I have a small business banking person that I refer to. I have somebody even on within mortgages um, that I refer to on, on commercial deals, on private mortgage deals. Um, and I also have um, insurance people. And my focus is on what I do best. Doesn't mean that I ignore those other things and don't don't think they're important, but I recognize that it's important to have partners around you that that make you look good. So I that's what I that's what I do. I, I don't try and sell fifty million things. I don't expect a, a, a referral fee from those people. All I expect is that they refer their clients back to me. Right, just trade business. I remember m- many years ago when I first got into brokering, I met with Bob Ward and with my business partner, and this me and this guy were quite we, we were quite exuberant and excited about all the things that we were going to do or could do. And Bob listened to us as we were you know talking about it, and he's just listening and listening. And finally, after we're done, he gets up and he walks up to the whiteboard and he writes the word mortgages on it, and then he writes a circle around it, and he's like, "If you just do that." you'll do just fine. And basically telling us we need to focus, right? I, it, took yeah. me many, it took me many years to actually listen. Like now I feel like, Keep okay. Simple. Keep, he's like, just do this. You don't need to do all that stuff. Because we were like, we were on the whiteboard doing this and then we could do that. And he's just like, you know, looking at us as yeah. a guy with wisdom, looking at these two young guys going, you, you guys are, you guys are out to lunch. So. You know, when I was a manager, um, I, I was approached by several different people who'd never been in the industry. And so it's like, you know, everybody heard the gravy train of uh, what a mortgage specialist slash broker could make, and it was like, okay, I'll just go sign up for this course, and, and you know, all of a sudden, I'm, this is who I am, right? So I used to make those people go through a practice of, what are you going to do in the first whatever many days uh, to become a specialist? And you wouldn't believe how many people I turned away, because they couldn't even answer that question. Mm-hmm. Like, how can you go, you might be a good salesperson, but how are you going to understand the nuances of a mortgage, right? Like, I think that's lost in translation today. 
it's, it's, it's lost as people are focused on, you know, internet. And, and I get that that's where a lot of the clients go, but if they go to the internet and they come to you, but you don't know how to put a deal together, what is the point? Right. What's the point of spending money to get them to call you if you can't yeah. put, put it together? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to switch to the rapid fire questions. So these questions you can answer a little shorter answers if you like. So what is the number one thing holding most mortgage brokers back from being successful? Um, well, I kind of answer that. Become a, an expert. Stop waiting for someone or something to make you successful. Do you have an internet resource, a program? Actually, I'd like to ask you about your CRM you use and then another program that you use that helps your biz- you run your business. Uh, you know what? Honestly, I use what the company provides. Um, I use Eximius for um, all of my back end. And then what, any other, I really any other programs? outside of that. Is there, is there anything else that you use? No. No. Is there anything else I don't have to think about it? Well, I, I mean, I, of course I have a website, and of course I have Facebook and Twitter and all that, but I, 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 I don't, that's not my focus. Again, I've hired people to make sure that I have a presence there, but I'm sure I can optimize it more, and there's going to be something that I can learn from that. Oh, okay, so there's a, perfect. So what, who, do you, who do you use to, that takes care of some of that um, social media stuff for you? Uh, I have Roar Solutions managing that for me. Roar, okay, cool. And do you, if you had a book you could recommend to our listeners, what would it be? You know, that one was like, oh my goodness, I don't, I don't, that's, I don't, I don't have a book. Sorry. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm a more, like, a, I'll listen to other people. Like, what you're doing, Scott, that's what I do, right? I, I listen to successful people, and I, I try and learn something from every interaction that I have. Okay, awesome. You don't, you don't have to have a book. It's just, just, uh, I don't and have a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. What, so where do you think our industry is headed right now? Where is the opportunity? Uh, I really do think the alt, uh, opportunity is more within the alt A, absolutely. Um, and I really think that as a mortgage, uh, mortgage brokers have the opportunity right now. There's people in the bank, they only have one product. And uh, it's the reason I made the move. And I believe it's going to become more and more important for you to have more, more product in terms of mortgage in your pocket, right? Because of policy changes, appetites, rules, you know, all of those things. I think it's important for, for our industry to be well armed with, um, with, with that. So, right. It's like playing golf with only one golf club in your bag. Exactly. And yeah, mortgage brokers. I think you'll see a shift of more, uh, bank specialists who are good at what they do looking at the, the mortgage brokerage profession. Right. You need different clubs for different, situations and and we we even as brokers need to be thinking about oh, we may have to pick up that case a different club to put in there because of what's the current market app like you said market appetites mm-hmm. so my one of my last question is so if you sold your business and you move somewhere about the size of edmonton and the same actually with warmer temperatures i'm just just joking <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. and if you um decided hey look i want to start a mortgage business again and you can't contact your old clients because you have a contract and you were starting from fresh, but you have the same knowledge. What would be like three things that you'd want to do to start your, this new business going as a mortgage broker? I'm, I'm lucky I did this. So I left for five years and I came back and, and I wasn't allowed to kind of do. So what, it, what would I do? I think it's important to connect to your community, whatever that community be. So, you know, if it's based on, um, you know, a, a geographical thing, if it's based on a culture, if it's based on a, I think it's important to do that. I think it's important to rely on others. Um, you know, um, if you've got referral sources within one community, ask them if they have leads into the next. Um, uh, I think it's important to be seen. You know, if you're going into a brand new community, I think it's important to join, um, um, you know, a chamber or a rotary club or, you know, something. Just get involved. Okay. And, and so when you started your business again, kind of after that five year break, you, that's what you did, right? You just get, get entrenched yeah. in the community, get to know yeah. people and, and find out ways how you can serve them. Right. So are you guys hiring right now? Am I hiring? Absolutely. Always hiring. Okay. So where can people find you online? Uh, my website, www.hollycochran.com. 
Okay, so thank you, Holly, for agreeing to do this interview. Uh, it's been fantastic from your bank manager to mortgage specialist to mortgage broker and, and uh, just the processes that you've put in place. It's interesting when I talk to people who've been, has got them out of experience, you've got much more experience than me, but people who have the experience you have, they typically are not so keen to take on, you know, new technologies or new ways of doing things. And you are embracing them like crazy. And so I think that's awesome. And we all need to, to be more like that. So if our listeners want to find it from this show or other shows that we have, they can go to ilovemortgagebrokering.com and in the search bar, type in the name Holly and they'll find the show notes along with links and they can track down Holly if they are looking to hire. Thanks again, Holly. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Scott. Want to rock your mortgage business? Then crank up the volume with your host, Scott Techford, on I Love Mortgage Brokering. Hi, Broker Nation. If you enjoyed this interview, please take a minute, visit iTunes, and rate this podcast. If you do, you'll get three deals in the next month. Okay, that's not true, but I would really appreciate it. Also, I want to invite you to join me on a quest. After every episode, I personally take five minutes and think about one thing or one idea I can use to improve my mortgage business. I encourage you to do the same. Over the next 12 months, I plan to do 100 interviews and make 100 improvements. I'm going to track these to see how they impact my business and more importantly, my bottom line. Visit ilovemortgagebrokering.com and post in the show notes what one thing you plan to do differently after listening to this interview and check out what other brokers are sharing. Also, if you'd like to connect with me, fire me an email at scott at robyourbank.com. I love hearing from passionate mortgage professionals who are interested in improving their business. Until next time, rock on.